Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second um, STEM Life Science webinar this fall semester uh, on biomedical engineering. Um, the program, as you know, uh, is offered by the Center uh, of, for Excellence in Education at no cost to the participants. The Center for Excellence in Education was founded in 1983 by Gian Di Gennaro and Leander Ricover, father of nuclear navy and civil duties of nuclear power, with the mission to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. Currently, the program offers, uh, the center offers uh, four programs for teachers and students, namely the Research Science Institute, USA Bio-Olympiad, Teacher Enrichment Program, and uh, more recently, the STEM Life Science uh, Program. Uh, back to our STEM Life Science uh, um, webinar. Today's session will focus on the topics of prosthetic engineering, neural stimulation and brain plasticity for rehabilitation purposes. We have two amazing speakers, Dr. Jason Koch, who is the Mark Newman Family Chair of Orthopedic Surgery and Director of Orthopedic and Spine Institute in North Shore University Health Systems, and Dr. Erin Christie, who is a postdoctoral associate in rehab neural imaging labs in University of Pittsburgh. We will learn today about their amazing work, about outstanding research and advances in the field, as well as about their career path, their skills, and experiences that cemented their professional life. As usual, at the end of the webinar, we will have a 15 minute session when you can ask our speakers any questions you may have on the topics presented so far. With this, I would like to pass the word to Dr. Jason Ko uh, for the first presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jason Ko, and I am currently a, a, the orth, an orthopedic surgeon and uh, chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and director of the Orthopedic and Spine Institute Specialty Hospital at the North Shore University Health System. I'm also a clinical professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Chicago and also an adjunct professor of biomedical engineering and a founding member of the Center for Advanced Regenerative Engineering at Northwestern University. What is biomedical engineering? Well, uh, it's a couple of different things. There is uh, the application of principles and problem solving techniques of engineering to biology and medicine. Uh, this can encompass biomechanics, as you can see at the top right, uh, biomaterials and regenerative tissue engineering, where you can actually print new tissues. Uh, and we're actually doing 3D bioprinting now. Um, cell and molecular engineering, imaging and biophotonics, medical devices and instrumentation like the deep brain stimulator that you see at the bottom right and neural engineering. Uh, just a little bit about myself and how I ended up doing this wonderful field. Uh, I grew up in uh, Chicago in the suburbs. I went to a public high school uh, that uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was filmed at. Um, it's an old movie. Uh, and I attended a CEE program uh, as a high school student called a Research Science Institute. Uh, and I ended up doing uh, rat research at Georgetown University Medical Center. And that really stimulated my, my interest in scientific research. And then uh, following that, I went to Harvard College uh, for my undergraduate degree in biology. Uh, I also spent summers at the National Institutes of Health doing uh, neurobiology research. And for my senior thesis at Harvard, I did immunology research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Following my undergraduate uh, time, I uh, spent some time at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, Scientifique in uh, France, uh, working at the University of Strasbourg, uh, doing protein crystallography research. Uh, and then subsequently, I went to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine for my medical degree, where I also did biomechanics research on uh, soft tissue healing through titanium implants. Um, I followed that with a surgical internship at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and then an orthopedic residency 
uh, in orthopedic surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, uh, Cornell Medical School, uh, where I did research on total hip implants, spine surgery, cartilage transplantation, and on scaffold for soft tissue repair. I then did a sports medicine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, where I did research on cartilage transplantation, MRI image evaluation, and biomechanics. Also worked with the Cleveland Browns football team and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, this is pre-LeBron James. Uh, and then I went back to Chicago, which was my hometown. Uh, as a faculty member at Northwestern, I worked with the Chicago Cubs, uh, Joffrey Ballet, Chicago Fire Soccer Team, and the USTA Pro Circuit uh, Tennis Tour uh, as a sports medicine physician. But I also did work in tissue engineering, cartilage transplantation, and shoulder surgery. Um, about 12 years ago, I moved to the North Shore University Health System, academically affiliated with the University of Chicago, um, where I am now the uh, Mark R. Neiman Family Chair of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, I'm director of the Orthopedic and Spine Institute, which you can see at the bottom is our Orthopedic Specialty Hospital, and a clinical professor at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm also a founding member of the Center for Regenerative Engineering at Northwestern University, and also participate in studies with a biomechanics laboratory at the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago. I've published over 100 papers and uh, three books on uh, different aspects of orthopedic surgery and orthopedic biomechanics. So my interest is as an orthopedic surgeon with an interest in understanding the mechanics of the body and how to treat it while injured. Uh, sometimes you can see that uh, we can actually do a lot of uh, finite element analysis modeling uh, this is actually a model of doing a deep knee squat in a patient who has a patella instability. Orthopedic surgeons treat a range of different uh, conditions involving the musculoskeletal system uh, from children to adults uh, and the very old. I'd like to sort of review some of the things we do. Uh, one of the things we've uh, been uh, interested in for a number of years is knee cartilage transplantation. Knee cartilage doesn't heal on its own. And so there are different ways that we try to regrow it. Uh, one of the things that I've been involved in for the last 10 or 15 years, about 15 years now, is an FDA trial on regrowing people's own cartilage. There is a scaffold made out of collagen. You can see there's a kind of a spongy layer uh, when you look at it under electron microscopy. And it can be seeded with cartilage cells or chondrocytes. Uh, it's a biphasic uh, membrane, so the top part is more uh, linear and the bottom part is more of a sponge. And you can see in D that it forms a cartilage-like uh, substance. So this is a quick animation of some of the uh, things that happen when we do this type of work. Uh, we take a small plug of cartilage from inside the knee. The cells are separated and harvested. They're grown in culture. And then they're seated on a scaffold. The cells grow and adhere to the scaffold. We're able to uh, clean out the damaged part of cartilage at the end of the knee. With a template, we can actually cut and then transplant uh, new cartilage into this area. So it involves a, a lot of uh, intersection between cells and materials and uh, surgery. Um, we assess this by looking at uh, MRIs, and you can see that uh, in some of these cases, you can actually see the regrowth of cartilage. And again, this is an example of how biomedical engineering is involved in terms of many different ways with the care of patients. Uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of physics, uh, magnetism, electricity involved with the imaging, um, but also understanding the complex chemistry. One of the other things we've been involved in is using pharmacogenomics, which is uh, tracking people's individual genomes and biomedical engineering is involved with this in terms of uh, developing the instrumentation using to sequence uh, these uh, people's genomes and uh, helping us uh, track and identify which genes are important. Another aspect of orthopedic surgery that is heavily involved with biomedical engineering is the use of robotic surgical techniques. So typically we will obtain a 3D CT scan uh, obtain uh, basically a virtual representation and then map out the actual bone using optical tracking uh, in 3D. 
and then we can uh, actually use a robot to help precisely drill and ream and allow us to position uh, implants uh, precisely in the actual body after doing it on a simulated 3D model in the computer. I'm actually a shoulder surgeon, and so one of the techniques we use is actually 3D planning. Uh, you can see that there's a very deformed looking shoulder there. Uh, we can play around with it, segment out the separate components, and we can actually try uh, different sizes of implants uh, ahead of time in the body. The glenoid is the socket part, and so you can try different components, place them at different angles. Um, and different sizes to see which fits best into the particular patient. After that, particularly in complex cases, we actually can uh, make a 3D model. And uh, you can see that we can use a precise uh, metric tool um, that allows us to very precisely place our guide pins on the uh, glenoid socket. Other areas where we use complex 3D imaging and sometimes 3D planning is in complex spine surgery. Uh, this is uh, the patient of one of them, uh, my partners. Uh, and you can see this child has a significant curvature of their spine. Um, we would obtain a CT scan uh, segmented out and we were able to actually print out the 3D model of the spine, which allowed us to more precisely plan correctly. Uh, you can see how much curvature there is, 56 degrees on the left side, and it's down to 14 degrees on the right side. Um, this was a young man who liked to play basketball. Uh, and one year after surgery, he was doing well. He had no pain. Uh, the curve was basically eliminated. He was able to play sports, including basketball. And since he was an inch and a half taller after his crooked spine was straightened out, uh, that did help his basketball game. And uh, some of the work that we've done in 3D printing has been the focus of a number of different journals, Orthopedics Today, MIT Technology Review, and US News World Report. So currently we're involved in uh, orthopedic research in a number of ways involving biomedical engineering. Uh, one aspect is biomechanics. And so it's the laboratory testing of orthopedic injuries and interventions. Uh, I'm involved with sports medicine, so I do a lot of work with shoulder injuries, ACL, other types of knee problems, and I have colleagues also involved with working on the spine. Some of this involves testing up cadavers uh, using various pulley systems and uh, motion analysis and motion capture, as well as uh, strain gauges. Um, another type is you can actually use a computer tech scan, uh, which allows us uh, measuring of uh, pressures or actually computer modeling. So one of the areas we've been interested in is uh, in what happens with the knee and other different types of loading conditions and injuries uh, to the meniscus cartilage, which is a kind of rubbery shock absorbing cartilage between the thigh bone and the shin bone. And then another area, as we previously showed, was uh, looking at computer models of patella or kneecap tracking. And so we were able to actually simulate what happens um, in a computer system. Now, our propeller tracking and contact pressure distribution, which is where the pressure is on the kneecap when the knee bends, is validated um, by testing it and comparing it to actual human being. Um, so these were knees that were uh, based on 3D models that uh, CT scans that were scanned in of actual patients going through bending motion of their knee. And then uh, we were able to build 3D models and then test how uh, the different surgical interventions helped improve uh, the tracking of the kneecap. Another area that I've been particularly involved in for the last uh, 25 years or so is uh, tissue engineering. Um, and this is around rebuilding the musculoskeletal system. The uh, body has a very complex architecture. Um, and there's a lot of areas where different tissues join together. Uh, because I do a lot of shoulder surgery and sports medicine, that's more focused on soft tissue attachment, like tendons and ligament attachment to the bone. And there's the interaction that occurs there. So why should we think about doing tissue engineering? Uh, many tissues have limited regeneration or healing ability. Um, sometimes we'll use autologous tissues or pieces of tissue from patients' own bodies to repair devices uh, or repair damaged tissue. But there, you're basically taking from one part of the body and moving it to another part. 
And so you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. There's also risk with transplants from other patients, including disease transmission and potential rejection. So the idea that you can actually print out um, a scaffold or material, or even uh, load it with cells uh, and just make a, a off the shelf rebuilt solution is very attractive. So one of the things that I've been involved in for over the past almost 17 years at this point is a novel elastomeric biodegradable composite scaffold, uh, polyoctane dial citrate, which is uh, basically uh, citric acid. I think we're all familiar with citric acid if you like, you know, orange juice or lemonade or limes. Um, it's a normal comp component of the human body. Um, and almost all cells in the human body use the citric acid cycle as part of their metabolism. It's, it's the way they basically break things down to get energy. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Guillermo Amir at Northwestern, um, developed a way to actually take this and make this into a elastomeric material. So elastomeric, as you can sort of see, um, it bends and it's kind of rubbery. Um, so it has unique properties, unlike a lot of other materials that we use for tissue engineering, which are often very brittle. Now, this has a lot of advantages because uh, many things in the body are actually pretty flexible. You know, if you're just entirely stiff, then you'd probably move like a tendon. So the area that I've been particularly interested in is cartilage injuries and osteochondral, which is injuries involving both the cartilage and the bone. These are very common in patients' knees. 63% uh, of knee arthroscopies have some cartilage damage. It can be a source of significant pain and morbidity or loss of function, and it really impairs quality of life for people, as much as uh, sometimes severe arthritis. The other thing is uh, it's been known for at least three decades that <laughs> cartilage doesn't heal. Um, so there was a Scottish uh, physician, Hunter, who said ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome thing. Once destroyed, it is not repaired. And I think we've all seen cartilage at the end of, say, a chicken bone, and it's white and shiny. Uh, and it's white and shiny because there's no blood supply to that area. So without any blood supply, there's a limited amount of nutrients available, and so it doesn't really heal. What we were able to show uh, in a laboratory setting was that if we had a scaffold made out of the citric acid um, material, we could seed it with human chondrocytes or cartilage cells. And you could see that what happens, uh, this is what the control is on the left side. Uh, it's a uh, porous uh, scaffold. And then uh, in the middle, you can see what happens over 14 days is that the cells, the little roundouts are starting to grow all over. And then at 28 days, they've really sort of all grown together and that uh, formed a continuous layer over the porous uh, parts of the cartilage of the uh, citric acid. And so we could see that um, over time, uh, the cartilage cells liked growing on the uh, polycitric acid and uh, proliferated. And so what we showed is that um, uh, the uh, white part is the um, residual scaffold, and the center part with all the little dark nuclei are cells that are growing inside the scaffold. And around the cells is type two collagen. And so that's the red staining stuff on the right part of the slide. Uh, and type two collagen is the particular type of collagen that we see in articular cartilage. That's the cartilage at the end of your bones. And so in a rabbit model, uh, we were able to show that um, the uh, implant, we made a little area where there was a little damaged cartilage and we put a little plug made out of the citric acid into the divot. You can see it actually grows in really well, it looks pretty normal. So that's at 28 days. And then this is even at further time points. You can see sort of a scar around where it was here at an earlier time point. And then uh, with more time, it really just starts to blend in and it looks pretty normal. So on the left side is the citric acid with hydroxyapatite, which is a kind of calcium that's found in bone. And you can see what happens is that cartilage forms all over it. It looks nice and healthy and pretty homogenous. 
on the right side, you can see there's a little bit of cartilage material, but a bunch of other types of other materials sort of mixed in. Um, so we felt that this was very successful in showing that we could regrow cartilage in this area. The other thing is that um, we showed that uh, it was able to uh, be biocompatible and osteoinductive, which means that uh, it lives well and it does well inside living animals and that it promoted the both of growth of bone and tissue ingrowth. So you can see on the POCHA is that the um, bone and uh, bone matrix, which is these uh, specs here, are uh, right up against the uh, citric acid scaffold, which is the sort of more homogenous part. Uh, as opposed to PLLA, which is a different kind of scaffold material made out of lactic acid. Uh, lactic acid, um, you know, it's in some kinds of milk and it's a painful uh, buildup of, that happens when you work out too much and um, it irritates the joint. And you can see that in the polylactic acid material, there's a separate layer sort of all surrounding that material instead of sort of being as integrated as the polycitric acid. So at 26 weeks or half a year, you can see what happens with our plugs. And again, they look pretty healthy uh, as time goes on, early time point, mid time point, and then at 26 weeks. So another area is we actually looked at um, anterior cruciate ligament injury. Um, so sorry about the video. And there is a football player and uh, you know you can run and get injured. Uh, an anterior cruciate ligament is an important ligament that keeps the knee stable, particularly with pivoting and cutting maneuvers. It's pretty common and it's a very uh, commonly done operation in the United States, uh, particularly among athletes. Uh, in the US, there's over 300,000 done a year at an annual cost of over a billion dollars. So current ACL grafts are typically usually made out of cutting parts of people's own bodies apart, and then using that piece to rebuild uh, the ligament. Um, you can either take out a couple of the hamstring tendons, uh, which obviously probably weakens those, or cutting a chunk of your kneecap and the patella tendon out, and then using that to rebuild the ligament. Um, alternative is to use allograft, which is donated tissue from somebody who's died. Um, but there is a much higher rate of re-tear, about 10 times higher um, in younger patients, and also a risk of disease transmission or reduction of the graft. So one of the things we did was, goal was to tissue engineer the ACL um, that included all biodegradable materials and stem cells. And so we actually had several components. Uh, one part, which is went into the bone, um, and one part, which is simulating the ligament in the center. And so we used again our uh, polycitric acid scaffold uh, around a polylactic acid fibers in the middle because the PLLA, the polylactic acid is much stronger uh, in tension than polycitric acid. So this was a composite graph. Uh, the porous hydroxyapatite, uh, POC hydroxyapatite um, allowed bone growth. And so you can see lots of holes here where cells and other tissue can grow in. And we used a technique where actually we used a vacuum. So you suck the air out of this material, uh, out of an area that you mixed, and it actually creates little pockets and bubbles uh, within the material. So you can see what the composite graph looked like. Um, on the right side, you can see the cut fibers of the polylactic acid. Um, and then on the, on, on the right side, and then on the left side, you can see sort of the uh, holes. It's almost like baking. Uh, it looks like a bagel. Um, but, uh, and those are embedded, you know, the material is embedded around the polylactic acid fibers, but there's plenty of holes to allow tissue to grow in. So the PLLA fibers were FDA approved, biodegradable, and actually stimulate um, fibroblast-like, uh, you know, fiber cells uh, when, it, when uh, stem cells are put onto it. And it was, had good mechanical strength. So we did a rabbit study. And um, after a year, 
uh, we saw that the bone graft uh, part uh, integrated well with the bone. That's the top two parts of the slide. Uh, the second uh, row is where uh, the junction between the ligament fibers and the bone was. And then the third and bottom parts are the other parts of the ligament and then where the uh, graft is going into the tibia, the shin bone. And uh, this work was felt to be pretty important and actually was featured on the cover of two uh, really exciting magazines, Tissue Engineering Part C. I know all of you have a copy of this at home. Um, and the Journal of Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine, which is almost as popular as people. So, um, but in the world of tissue engineering, um, this is pretty exciting stuff. So we were pretty thrilled about that. And uh, because it was about a common sports injury, a whole bunch of people decided to take up the published results. And uh, we got quoted in like Engadget, and Fox News and Futurism and eTechnic and a whole bunch of other uh, media outlets picked us up. Um, probably the last time I've been on the, those kind of stations. So, so one of the exciting things for us now is that uh, after our first papers were published around 2006, is actually um, it's now being used in patients. Uh, so uh, the technology was further developed by um, a company called Acuitive. And then uh, they developed uh, these types of screws uh, that can hold a tendon graft in place. Um, and you can see that they're, uh, you know, have a kind of unique design uh, with a more of a swivel rather than like a screw type design. And this allows us to compress the tendon in a tunnel against the side of the tunnel without lacerating the tendon, uh, which normal screws can do. And um, one of the largest kind orthopedic companies in the world, Stryker, uh, has uh, licensed the technology and is now using it to make these tendon attachment devices for the foot and ankle. So that's a little bit about uh, my work and orthopedic um, biomechanics and biomedical engineering uh, as applies to orthopedic surgery. I think um, it's uh, been really great for me to be involved with this field over a number of years. Uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, it's been a gradual process and it builds upon a lot of collaboration with colleagues. Uh, one of the things that for me was really important was the opportunity to uh, get to do research. And, uh, you know, for me, I sought it out, as you saw, over many years, um, as many opportunities as I could. And um, uh, in particular, I'm very appreciative of the Center for Excellence in Education and its programs because uh, for me, that was really the starting point for me to be able to I get an experience with doing some research activities. Um, there's a tremendous amount of resources and support uh, that they put into STEM education. And uh, for me, that uh, really put me uh, on a career that I've really enjoyed about being able to do exciting research that can make a difference in people's lives, uh, in addition to uh, being a great uh, surgeon and doctor allowing me to take care of great patients. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Go. This was amazing, very, very interesting research. Uh, we are very happy to, to hear your amazing work and uh, the advances in the field, which are quite outstanding. So thank you so much for participating in the program and uh, for sharing with us uh, our your experience and uh, your research. Um, thank you. And uh, now we are um, going to give Erin um, the, uh, the word and she can uh, proceed with the presentation she, pre she prepared for this uh, webinar. Erin, you might want to add me, uh, unmute yourself, please. Uh, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you okay. can. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me to this talk and, and for this wonderful opportunity uh, to sort of talk about some of the work I've done, as well as how I got to the point for doing this research. Uh, so first off, my name is Dr. Erin Grigsby. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at University of Pittsburgh and uh, within, a, within a group called RNEL, so that's Rehab Neural Engineering Labs, which is basically just a conglomerate of about 10 labs where you're having undergraduate, graduate students and 
fac faculty and postdocs work together to sort of address a lot of neural rehabilitation questions uh, varying from on various fields. So today what I'd like to talk about is how to improve uh, motor and speech outputs following neurological injury. So specifically, I'm interested in stroke. So let's first talk a little bit about me. So as I said, I'm Erin Grigsby. Um, I'm a neural engineer. So this basically means is that I'm going to apply engineering techniques to questions involving neuroscience, anything involving the brain or spinal cord. Um, I have extensive training in electrophysiology, so I, which basically means that what I do is I record electrical single, signals from the brain and use them to answer very basic uh, science questions or even translational questions. I'll get a bit more into this at the very end, but my education is I had a dual degree in biomedical uh, engineering and electrical and computer engineering. Uh, I then also got my master's in biomedical engineering and then my PhD is in bioengineering, which is about the same as what bio, uh, biomedical engineering is. Now, a big thing to know about me and, and what I sort of do with this work is I am very interested in motor control. So this is the idea of how it is that the brain is able to control how we can move very fluidly and effectively within the world. So um, throughout my career, I've kind of built up from a very uh, simple to more complex things. So first, the center of motor control is going to be the motor cortex. So that's what's highlighted in uh, yellow right here. Um, and so what I first started doing when I started working on research was just asking very basic, was just asking questions looking at the single neuron level. So the brain is composed of a lot of neurons. And so within that, we can actually directly record from a single cell and start to ask questions about the properties of that behavior. I then moved on to considering um, populations of activity. And so instead of recording from one cell, we're now uh, recording from a small network. So here I'm representing as three. But typically what I'd actually be doing is recording from about 100 units in the motor cortex. And so now we can start to see how these interact. And now within my work that I do now, um, I'm actually looking at how the interaction is across multiple areas. So this is motor cortex, which is an area that sort of is the in charge of most of our movement. But other areas include pre, uh, premotor cortex or PMD, and then also thalamus, which is shown right here. So by how these are connected, we can sort of see how we want to move. So why do I care about motor control? Well, it's really cool. We can perform some complex motor control with relative ease. So here I'm showing a professional tennis player and she's hitting her forehands over and over again. You can see that they're different shots because I kind of labeled them. But despite the fact that they're very different, the movement is always looking very, very consistent. And while she's likely, she's a much better tennis player than I am, you can see that she seems to be doing it with relative ease. So she's adapting to where the ball is, she's keeping moving on her feet and is able to hit the same movement over and over. But this should be a fairly complicated thing because of all the things she has to adapt to, and yet it's not. Another example of effective motor control is here. So this is someone kind of using almost like a fidgeting device, which has a weight in it. And so what they're going to be doing is moving these balls around in their head. And so you're demonstrating that there's a lot of high finger dexterity of how they can manipulate these balls and also how they're responding to the force in their hand as it moves. Now, again, this seems like something that should be relatively difficult of them kind of thinking about how to move each of their hands, but much more likely happening in this instance is someone is sort of doing this absent-mindedly while they're doing some other type of task. Now, I'm also interested in speech. There is a lot of motor control that goes into speech, so I can show two examples. So here we have a very exaggerated singer, as you can see, and what you can see is that they there's a lot of coordination ha that's happening in the movement. So they're in their arms, they're doing breath support, they're opening and making large ex facial expressions to sort of help echo and accentuate the sound that they're producing. There's also a lot of uh, motor control within the actual production of sound itself. So here's a video of someone who's just going to hold a different, a single note, but demonstrate by that how they're able to vary that note in very dramatic ways. Cool. So as you hear, cool. So as you heard within that, this was, she was able to produce a lot of different sounds and vibrations without actually having to do a lot of change. Now, why is this important? All of these things we can do with relative ease until something breaks. So an effective way we can see something breaking is stroke. So stroke is a leading cause of, of lost motor control. Um, basically what happens within stroke is you lose, uh, there's a loss of blood supply to a brain area that then results into two deaths. You can see that right here. 
So basically what it means is that at some point there might have been some type of blockage or some type of swelling that resulted in the, there being no blood to get to this area and now the brain can no longer use that tissue. Um, so with this, that can lead to a variety of motor and speech deficits. So these can include muscle weakness. So you might see that someone is not able to sort of uh, lift up things or they it's much, they're much weaker in their arms or even in their facial expressions. Uh, you're going to see a loss of uh, arm and hand dexterity, so they're not able to have the same level of pre precision of grasp as they used to. And you also might see an increase of rigidity of muscles. This is also called spasticity. And so it basically means is that you're going to see a large amount of contraction of all of their muscles. So like when you're holding your fist really tight and they aren't ever able to truly relax that. Stroke is very prevalent. So within the United States, there are over 400,000 new patients each year that experience some type of stroke. And unfortunately, right now, there's really no effective therapies for post-stroke paralysis. So currently, the best gold standard is to just simply do phys intensive physical, physical therapy and speech therapy. But both of those have limited impact um, for more severe cases. And overall, just within the United States, there are over 5 million people living with post-stroke motor impairment. So this is a really large population that we can help. Thinking now about some of the, speech, the motor speech deficits caused by stroke. Um, so first, it is a very prevalent thing. So about a third of all chronic stroke patients will face persistent speech deficits. So people are doing the math on that. That's a little over a million people. And there are three different ways that this kind of this will show within the, within their, um, this will show. So first, there's this arthria. So this is sort of a slur a slurring of the speech, which is often caused by muscle. Uh, uh, muscle weakness. Unfortunately, it looks like my audio clip is not working for that. So sorry about that. Uh, there's also dysphagia, uh, which is a difficulty of swallowing uh, food or drinks. So what's typically going to you're going to see with this is that there's an excess production of saliva, and it makes it very difficult for people to understand them because it kind of sounds like there's something there's something always in their mouth, and it makes it also really difficult because there's always a concern of choking for these patients. Finally, there's uh, apraxia or speech apraxia, which is this idea of stuttered or slowed speech patterns. So because they aren't able to coordinate their movements, they really are going to struggle to initiate any type of conversation. Now, these things are not just um, present in stroke patients. There are many other pathologies that experience this. So one is going to be uh, Parkinson's disease, any type of traumatic brain injury. So those might be a concussion, um, a brain, any type of brain tumor or ALS. So all of these are going to be things where you're going to basically disrupt the communication of the cells, which is going to impact speech. And again, with this, there is uh, unmet clinical needs. So there is no drug, device, or really truly effective therapy to help these people. So a question that we had within my lab, within the lab space I work in is, can we take advantage of already existing technology to try and help these pa this patient population? So this led us to thinking about uh, brain stimulation or DBS, um, which is the idea of we implant an, an electrode lead deep into the deep into deep structures in the brain, and then we kind of are able to we have battery pack here, and we're able to actually apply electrical stimulation to those deep brain structures. And so by stimulating those, we can start to actually sort of change how the cells communicate with each other. So this is used in a wide, uh, this is widely used treatment for several disorders, including psychiatry and pain. People are probably are most commonly uh, familiar with it for essential tremor in Parkinson's. Um, it is FDA approved, safe and effective, and it's able, it's implanted about 12,000 times a year. Now, again, going back to Huntington and Parkinson's, a key feature of, of these, of these uh, pathologies is you're going to typically see rigidity of movement and um, an essential tremor. And so one advantage of deep brain stimulation is when it's on is you can quickly see the improvement. So to give an example here on the left, we're going to see this is a patient suffering from Parkinson's when the stimulator is off. And as you can see, there's a really high amount of tremor within his hands. You can also see that there's a lot, there's less of balance and he's kind of struggling to take large steps. When we turn the stimulator on, you can see that the patient is able to walk quite, quite effectively and we see minimal tremor even within his hands. So this is demonstrating this is a very effective and safe suggestion for us to use. So the question is, is why do we think that this might be effective for our patient population? Well, let's talk through a little bit about what happens within a stroke patient. So here I'm just showing on the right, we're going to see about the area of the motor control. And then I'm kind of representing in yellow is this is a communication from the, cort the motor cortex down 
to our motor output. So that could be reaching or that could be speech. And so that follows through spinal cord. And then what we also have is behind this, behind this connection here, you're gonna find the motor thalamus. So that's the deep brain structure. And so what happens when we when we if, when a patient suffers from a stroke is typically we're going to see some type of breaking of we're going to see some type of breaking of this communication between the motor cortex and our whatever your motor output is. And so when you when you stop blood flow here, you're going to end, ultimately cause death of that of those connections. And so basically that means is now the motor cortex is going to send the same amount of information, but there's just less fibers connecting it, so it'll send the information less effectively. Now, one thing to know that's very cool is motor thalamus currently also directly projects to motor cortex. And so our thought is, if we are able to stimulate in this deep brain structure like motor thalamus, we may actually be able to cause motor cortex to send more signal, which means that it will it'll can make up for the loss projection between motor cortex and motor output. So our goal is to use deep brain stimulation to target the motor thalamus. So in order to demonstrate whether or not this works, we need to, there's a few things we need to do. We first need to demonstrate that we see an increased excitability uh, in the motor cortex is going to increase motor uh, cortical spinal motor output. So that's just the communication. So in order to first do this, what we did was we took uh, non-human primates or monkeys, and basically we were able to do the exact same setup where we did a DBS electrode in the brain, and then we were able to stimulate that while the animal was evoking. And so then we could monitor their muscles to see, do we see any improvement of their reaching during this behavior? Following this, we then need to see if there's an increase in functionality for movements. So again, is this movement, is the stimulation actually increasing the muscle activity we observe uh, compared to when there is no motor thalamus stimulation? And finally, we wanna see if this increases functional for speech. So for a first pass within primates, what we're just going to do is we're gonna record EMGs along the face to see, are we seeing increased uh, movement of those facial muscles with, via, with stimulation. And so what we did in fact see was that with increased excitability, we did see increased motor output. So focusing just on this upper lip EMG that we saw is in this plot here, we observe what the motor evoked stimulation response was. So just how much the motor, uh, the muscle was engaged when it was, when it was stimulated. And then when we paired that, in, that engagement with the lambic stimulation at either 50 or 100 hertz, we saw that the muscle movement got bigger. Uh, and then as we do a summary of all, of all sessions and all trials, we again see that there was a much larger increase in the overall amplitude and also variability of this. So we're seeing that you're an overall seeing much larger movements as you engage the muscles. So stimulation increases motor output in the face. We then wanted to just demonstrate this uh, in the arm as well. So what we did was we increased excitability. Uh, we're just gonna show a video of what it looks like in the arm as well. So just to give you guys a warning also before I start this, um, we do have, this is going to show an animal who's, who's it, during a surgery, the animal is, is anesthetized. And so we're gonna first demonstrate this, we're going to demonstrate that thalamic stimulation alone isn't going to produce a response. Uh, it is only when it's paired with a motor evoked response that we should actually see a change. And I will just say, if you don't like any, see any squeamish things, feel free to look away and I will tell you when to look back. Okay, so here is just the thalamus stimulation alone. If you see here on the hand, you're seeing no, no movement whatsoever. When we then start doing a muscle evoked response, you can see that we're seeing a little bit of twitching right here on the thumb. And then when we pair that with the motor, the, uh, motor thalamus stimulation, you see that we're recruiting much more of the arm and the hand and the movements just in general are bigger. We can then increase that even more by increasing the frequency of which we're stimulating. And again, you're seeing that there's much more recruitment here and there's even more recruitment along the face. So we next wanted to see if we see the, sim the same response in humans because while well, monkeys and, and humans have a lot of similar an anatomy, they're not exactly identical. And so what we did is we ran a similar experiment in patients who were being implanted with DBS electrodes and we found that the results were consistent. So here is when the muscle is just evoked, evoked with simple stimuli. We see that there's a small response that's very consistent. When we then add stimulation of motor thalamus, we see that the movement is much, much larger. So all this is really promising that we can actually use this as a treatment um, for stroke patients. Now, one thing again is we wanna see if we can actually use this technology for speech. Now, to tell you guys something that you may or may not be aware of, um, monkeys don't talk. 
So we're not able to actually run this experiment with the non-human primates. So instead we wanted to be able to use that. We wanted to come up with a paradigm where we could use this in, in um, patients. So what we did is we recruited two patients. So we had one patient that had suffered a traumatic brain injury uh, when they were much, much younger, which had resulted in having them having a mild speech impairment. And specifically when we looked at the imaging, we could see that there was a reduced motor, there was a reduction in the motor output tracks in the brain. Um, and then we also recruited a second patient who had suffered a much more recent brain injury that uh, looks much similar to how a stroke would manifest, and they had a quite a severe speech impairment. And with that, we not only saw a reduction, but actually a displacement of the motor output tracks. Now I'm going to kind of walk you through, I'm going to show these images and kind of walk them through. So for this first patient here, we're going to see that on the left is the injured uh, side of the motor cortex. On the right is the healthy side, and as you can see that the track is actually going to be a bit thinner and actually is no longer following the exact path because you see that the lesion exists right here. For our patient who has a much more severe, uh, much more severe in speech impairment, you're going to see that this happens again. So here's where you can identify the lesion. You can see that the tracks are moving much further away and that they're actually much thinner than they are on the healthy side. So this is demonstrating that we are actually seeing changes in the uh, atomic the anatomy of the structure. So how did we want to use, how did we want to test this? So there were two tests that we asked we wanted to run with uh, participants. So first we wanted to do a motor, in, which were motor and speech tests. So the first task we wanted to do was a speech therapy test. So these are the type of exercises people typically use when they're going through rehab following a stroke to try to regain some of their speaking abilities. So within these tasks, you have participants go from a really exaggerated facial expression, like a really big smile or opening their mouth wide, to really neutral facial expression. And you want them to do that over and over again, over about 30 seconds, um, as quickly and as largely as they can. And so by doing this, we can now assess whether or not we're seeing increases in the muscle response or EMGs as we import uh, stimulation. Now it is possible that we could see that increase but not actually see improvement in the speech. So we, the next assessment we want to see is whether or not we would see improvement specifically in articulation of speech. So there were two tasks we did for this. So one was a tongue twisters where patients had to say these tongue twisters as many times and as clearly as possible over a 30 second window. And then there was also, if the task was too difficult, we could use a single word rep repetition. So there's having them repeat these words over and over again loudly and clearly to see if we could pick out different articulatory responses. So let's first look at the results um, for our for the muscle test. So we we did in fact observe that muscle weakness uh, did improve when there was when we added stimulation. So here you're going to be looking at this patient who's making a smile face. And while you can see this patient is able to make a fairly large smile pretty easily and consistently, it looks reasonable without any stim. You can see it kind of actually starts to fade as he gets really tired of the task because it's not particularly fun to do it over and over again. But then when we add the stimulation um, of the motor thalamus, what we observe is that the facial expression is even bigger. So see that this, his cheek muscle is getting much, much larger, the lip is getting a bit lower. So we're seeing an increase in the recruitment of, of his EMGs. When we looked at these actually, to try and quantify what we again saw is just that. So when we stimulated motor thalamus, we saw that there was an increase, um, there was an increase in the response of the muscles. And much more than that, we also observed that they were a little bit shorter. So this meant that the patient was able to make larger movements much faster when we were stimulating the motor thalamus. Now, again, it is possible that this, we could see this improvement that may actually cause an impairment of speech. So we next wanted to look at is if there's an increase, whether or not there were any changes in the tongue twister. So first we did the kick tick uh, tongue twister, which I personally struggle with a lot, but so you should look to see is here if there's any type of stumbling. Kick tick, kick tick, tick, kick tick, kick tick, kick tick, kick tick. So some things I'd like you to kind of take away from that is there were a few times where the participant said the wrong word. So instead of saying kick, tick, they said kick, kick. There would also be times where he was struggling to sort of initiate speech or there was him stumbling on the second syllable. Now compare that to when we stimulate with the thalamus. Kick, tick, kick, tick, kick, tick, kick, tick, kick, tick, kick, tick. 
So what you can hear now is that the speech is much more consistent. We're hearing much less errors. And if we actually try and, try and quantify those, what we observed is that there was a significant decrease in air reduction in all of these errors when we applied stimulation. And we did this over multiple days to demonstrate that this wasn't simply an impact of learning. So again, with stimulation, the speech was more fluid, regular, and had uh, fewer speech arrest moments. So this was our mild participant. What about our participant who has a much more severe speech impairment? Uh, so for him, we had him do single words because he wasn't able to do the uh, tongue twisters. And some things I kind of want you guys to pay attention to is we've picked up these consonants because they have really strong articulables. So what you want, I, what I want you guys to pay attention to is the T, K, and P sound. So those should sound more defined when we have apply stimulation. So if you guys can hear, packer became more of packer, so he really struggled to say that uh, the CK sound. Now compared to when we did stimulation. So as you can hear, he's really starting to be able to say the K sound. Um, hang on one second. Um, so as you can hear, he's really starting to say the K sound really quite clearly, as well as the P sound. We then have the tick. And your guess. So with the tick sound, as you can hear, he's really struggling to initiate the T. So it's much more prolonged. And we're also again hearing sort of that swallowing of the K sound. Okay. So again, we're hearing that the word was much, much shorter and we could actually clearly start to pick out the word. So we have been working with this patient closely. The patient is still fully implanted and is going through rehabilitation. So we're hoping that we can start to see if we're seeing long-term improvement as the longer the stimulation is turned on. So what are some conclusions? So first and foremost, we saw that there was increased excitability and motor output uh, when we did uh, uh, thalamic stimulation. Second, we saw that there were larger and more consistent facial movements while we were stimulating. Third, there was a significant decrease in the number of errors with, when we did the tongue twister task, suggesting we're seeing improvement in speech. We saw a reduction in the uh, consonant slurring clearer speech and more defined and more refined articulation. So all of these things suggest that deep brain stimulation could be used as an effective therapy for speech deficit, motor speech deficits. So I was kind of asked to kind of present some of my own history. So then a question that many of you may have is, what exactly was my path to get to this research? So starting from the very beginning, um, I'm originally from Boulder, Colorado. And so I basically did all of my schooling um, K through 12 in Boulder in the public school system. Um, I was really, really interested always in math and sciences. And I was really fortunate that my public school um, actually had opportunities for me to take IB and AP courses. So I was kind of able to engage in a lot of those, especially loved chemistry and biology. Um, for, under, for college, I went to Duke University where I did a double degree in biomedical engineering and electrical and computer engineering. Um, this is kind of a really cool opportunity because when I had a first come to, when I was first in high school, I thought I really wanted to pursue kind of doing surgery and was very interested in doing just biology as, as a degree. But by doing engineering, I was kind of get a, able to get a lot of teaching opportunities where I was able to TA courses. Um, Duke University also had this very uh, uh, cool program called Pratt Fellows, which was basically they helped provide funding for you to ensure that you could do an independent research project in a lab space for a year and a half. And it was during this process that I was able to start doing research in transcranial magnetic st stimulation or TMS. So uh, TMS is another really cool innovation that's happening in neural engineering, where basically it uses uh, 
and applies this um, magnetic field to induce an elect to induce stimulation in the brain. So basically, it's a non-invasive way for you to stimulate the brain. Currently, it's used really it's used a lot for um, depression, and schizophrenia, and OCD treatment. Uh, but there's a lot a lot of certainty about how to effectively use this. So I was able to kind of work on that and was introduced into how to use that research both clinically and in primates. Uh, I really liked that research, so I actually ended up staying to get my master's in biomedical engineering at the university, and it, I was, it was very cool because I went from asking very engineering-based questions about TMS to being able to ask more mechanistic and basic science questions of TMS. Uh, I was also able to get a lot more teaching opportunities, so actually leading some classes. I taught some summer courses for high school students, middle school students, and uh, middle school students about research. Um, and within this space, I was able to kind of get a lot more information about basic science questions. Um, I did a shift for my PhD. So while I was really interested in some of the single cell work I had done with TMS, I was really interested in how neurons work together. So I decided to pursue my PhD here at the University of Pittsburgh, where I was able to do brain computer interface or BCI. Um, so this is a very cool work where basically what happens is you record from an area in the brain. And then by reading the output of that, you can actually control different items. So uh, some of the clinical work that BCI is currently used is we'll have patients who are paralyzed uh, be able to control robotic limbs. Um, how I used it is I actually had worked with uh, monkeys who would record from their motor cortex and have them play video games with their minds. So we'd be recording the activity, they'd be playing a video game, and we were able to ask some uh, basic science questions with that. This was also the place where I kind of got a lot more experience with computational neuroscience. So this is the idea of applying a lot of uh, programming and mathematical theories to modeling and considering how the brain work, the brain and spinal cord works. This then led me to my postdoc. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar, uh, a postdoctoral associate is basically just it's the in-between step between you get your PhD and before you go for a faculty position. So it's kind of meant to be used as an opportunity to train you about how to run your own lab. So within this lab space, I ha have switched back to doing stimulation. So now I do deep brain stimulation and really kind of focusing on a lot of clinical work. So one thing that's been very cool about this opportunity is uh, the lab space I work in has a lot of collaborations, both at act academia and industry. So that means that I'm able to directly work with neurosurgeons and doctors who are prescribing some of these treatments to sort of do some research, basic research questions with them and also sort of assess at how effective it's working. And then with the industry collaborations, we're able to work with companies, whether it be startups or well-defined companies, about how we can sort of change the design of these devices and order to be more effective for the patients. So just as a quick summary about how this worked, Basically, during when I was first growing up and around your guys' age, I really was trying to be, was able to develop an interest in science and sort of was able to give it an opportunity to explore what things I was interested in. During my undergraduate degree, I did a lot of engineering testing and sort of was asking questions about in neuroscience of the single cell application. So what is this one cell doing and how can I make this one component work better? For my PhD, I moved to basic science approach questions. So how can we use these new tools to ask really fundamental questions about the brain? And this is also when I started applying population techniques. So looking at multiple cells and how they interact with each other. Finally, for my postdoc, I've been doing translational and clinical work. So this idea of how can we apply these basic science questions and the results that we have to be beneficial for the patient population. And finally, I'm now, instead of looking at just a small network of populations in the cortex, I'm now looking at how multiple areas actually have it interact and coordinate with each other in order to enable us to effectively move. Um, I also, as I mentioned, was an electrophysiologist and I've been doing primate work, so I always include a timeline for how long I've been working with monkeys. So starting in undergrad, I started working with monkeys my sophomore year. Uh, where I was doing a mixture of fixing circuits and, and doing behavioral studies with monkeys. My PhD has been primarily, uh, my PhD was primarily with doing behavioral work with monkeys. And now my postdoc, I do about two thirds of my time is spent doing human work and a third is spent doing primary work. Some advice I might have for you guys as you're kind of thinking about what you want to do in the future. So first and foremost is challenge yourself. Um, I had some really great advice from a teacher of Take the courses that take the course is going to be a, as most challenging for you to kind of it's going to give you new opportunities. Uh, 
Second is to explore and consider different options and opinions. So like I said, I'd originally wanted to go to medical school and do really follow an MD, but at the recommendation of someone who knew that I like to build things, they recommended that I instead consider maybe applying for engineering at that. Um, share your ideas. So if you ever think an idea is not quite finished or something like that, kind of talk through the pros and cons because it's going to usually help you develop your idea a bit more, a bit further, and then also help you better articulate it to other people. And finally, most importantly, there's really no set path or starting point if you're interested in doing research. So uh, engineering has typically alternates between doing sort of device innovation where they're like, oh, if we just build this one thing out, everything will be perfect. And then also going back to, okay, let's apply this tool to really understand the mechanistic discovery. So it doesn't matter which direction you start, just having some starting point, you may have to ultimately do a switch, but it doesn't mean that you haven't made forward progress. And finally, you can always change course. So there is no one direct path to get to something. So it's perfectly fine to learn a skill set at different levels. Um, and then apply those for future directions. As a final thing, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's done the work with me throughout my career, and I'd like to open up for questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Christie. Amazing presentation and amazing research. Thank you for sharing, sharing it with us and uh, for sharing your career path uh, and um, uh, 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 research um, uh, skills and uh, uh, stages in your uh, career development. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, now we can open the session for questions. For all participants, uh, please um, uh, write down your questions in the Q&A section. I will uh, uh, read them and um, uh, make them uh, known to our speakers. Um, in the meantime, while the participants may prepare their questions, um, I will ask uh, um, the speakers one question each <laughs> to just warm up <laughs> uh, for uh, more questions if uh, if we have um, so so uh, Dr. Ko um, amazing and very interesting research um, I was wondering uh, first of all whether you have uh, the situation in which you you have uh, repeated injuries um, in say an articulation, whether it's the bone of the articulation or the cartilage, can one um, undergo multiple procedures to uh, reconstruct the articulation and uh, recover the function, the normal locomotive function uh, of the articulation? Sure. The, um... Uh, a lot of injuries happen with repetitive uh, stress or loads, and uh, the tissue wears out. What we're able to do currently with our techniques is typically able to fix areas where there's localized damage. I compare it to filling in a pothole rather than resurfacing the whole driveway. So we can do techniques that can help repetitive damage, but in many cases, again, uh, part of it is looking at the underlying reasons why that damage occurred. And so in some of those situations, there's some uh, abnormal alignment. And so there's excessive pressure on that area. Uh, and so that's where some of the um, contact pressure measurements in cadaveric studies or finite element analysis modeling uh, can show you if there's some abnormalities. Um, and then we can take that back, that inf kind of uh, information back and sort of compare it to uh, the patient situation. Uh, we're not at a point where we can do that kind of complex modeling uh, for every single patient, but we do have some uh, parameters that, you know, clearly if things aren't aligned properly, uh, we correct those at the time of uh, the surgical procedure uh, when we also put in the cartilage or bone transplant. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And then, uh, Dr. Christie, um, very interesting research. Uh, one may imagine that um, uh, stimulating the thalamus, which is uh, basically um, a 
uh, subcortical structure with many nodes that uh, project in various uh, cortical areas. Uh, so stimulating this area may open very uh, interesting opportunities, right? Not only to access or stimulate the motor cortex and in turn uh, the motor pathways uh, into the body, but also other parts of the body and other organs and such. Uh, I was just wondering if you have considered these possibilities and if you find any of them uh, worthy of pursuit. Uh, absolutely. So we actually, part of the reason why we came up with this is because the thalamus, as you mentioned, is a subcortical structure and there are multiple, what are sometimes called nuclei, which are basically just uh, centers of activity and those directly map to different areas of the brain. So one advantage of us by simulating the subcortical structure is we kind of are able to take advantage of the natural cortical, uh, of what the natural activity is that's happening on the cortex where a lot of the computation occurs. So well, we currently think that we well, initially, when we started this project, we just wanted to focus on force. But when we started to look at the anatomy, we realized that there might be an opportunity to also apply this for speech. Um, it's possible that there's also cognitive components that can be that could be useful that, that could be used for this. So, uh, another common uh, illness that sometimes happens is a, is called aphasia, and that's where uh, there's sort of a disconnect between what someone wants to communicate and what they're actually able to communicate. So. Maybe they'll try. They'll see a, a boat. They'll try and they want to say boat to tell the person that it's a boat, and then instead they'll say dog. And so it's possible that by using the stimulation of the thalamus, we may actually be able to improve some of these cognitive. All right, well, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we had a question for uh, Dr. Po, who already answered it. Thank you very much, Dr. Po. Um, for the moment, I don't think we have. For the audience, if you are thinking later on uh, questions for both our speakers, uh, you are welcome to relay them to me. Um, so as you probably know, my name is Roxana Stefanescu. I am the program manager for the STEM Lyceums programs. And you can find my email and contact information online on our website. So you can use the, my email to relay any questions you may have for our speakers. Um, I would relay them to you and uh, send you back that answer. Right. Um, so if there are no more questions, I will share my screen for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pop. Thank you, Dr. Vinci. It was a very interesting session, your research and experience is absolutely amazing and very informative to our audience. So thank you so much. I would also like to thank our sponsor, the CEE for, and the STEM Lyceum sponsors and partners. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today uh, and um, remind you to register and attend the next STEM Lyceum webinar, uh, which is on the theme of aerospace and it will be held on November 16, 2022 at 4 p.m. Uh, you can also visit our website for more recent information, for detailed links and any news and events that are uh, related to the program. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to conclude our session. Unless there are any more comments or our speakers, all good. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks everyone for joining us today. Agreed, thank, thank you so very much. much. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, thank you all for participating in this, uh, in our meeting today. Um, we will stop the session now and you are welcome to uh, join us in our next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Have a great day.